Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast. This is a show uh, dedicated to inspiring God's people to read, study, and meditate on His Word. I'm your host, Adam Castellano. Let's jump right into it. This episode, I want to start what might be a series uh, about the language of the Bible. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about the literal languages. Uh, the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek and a little bit of Aramaic. Um, I'm not talking about that. Uh, if you wanted to delve into that, there are Bible resources if you want to learn about the ancient Greek and Hebrew. And there's value in uh, looking up the words of a particular verse and seeing what the original Hebrew and Greek says, because it could give you insight into the meaning of the word and some extra understanding, some depth, and that's always a good thing. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the, the literary mechanics of the books of the Bible. You see, we might, as Christians, maybe if you live in America or in the West, speak English, we might take for granted the fact that very hard-working, dedicated people throughout centuries tirelessly collected the books of the Bible, preserved them, and then translated them into our language. In fact, people gave their lives so that they could make English translations of the Bible. And thanks to their hard work and service to the Lord, we have an easily accessible version of the Bible we could read and digest and meditate on every day, and we should. We might take it for granted that the books of the Bible were written by English people, and they weren't. They were written by largely Jewish people. Even the New Testament, although it's in Greek, it's written by Jewish people. And just like in any culture or in any language, there are certain literary mechanics that the Bible uses to communicate the Word of God. And while they're translated into English, you may have Bible teachers trying to structure those thoughts and sermons in a certain way. When we sit down and read the Bible, we sometimes might not fully grasp what it's saying because we may not be familiar with its language, with the way it's communicating. And the reason why that's kind of dangerous is because you might be familiar with the way a Christian teacher communicates uh, thoughts about your faith and, and God and all these, these ideas, but the way that they process it, the way they communicate it, the way they uh, organize it, and ultimately the way we live it out might not be the way God intends it to be. I'm not saying they're distorting the Bible. I'm saying they're presenting it and processing it in this very Western way of thinking. See, we in the West, we think very logically. Maybe not the people you know, but our school systems, our education systems, the way we process data, the way we structure our lives, the way we structure our businesses, even our governments, is a certain way. It's called Hellenistic. It's based on Greek thinking and culture and thought because the greeks influenced the romans and the romans basically made european society and we in america we're heavily influenced by that even our government even if you look at the old buildings in our in washington dc and other capitals they all look like ancient roman and greek buildings right it's because our tradition what we call classical thinking is based on greek thinking and Greek thinking, Western thinking, it's very much a logical, uh, organized, structural, systematic way of thinking. We put things in little boxes with labels on them. This is uh, science. This is math. This is art. This is education, history, etc., etc. And that's perfectly fine. We're studying secular things. But when it comes to the things of God, that's a very wrong way to approach it. Because if we approach our faith and the Word of God in this way, we want, we put them in little boxes with little labels just like everything else. And the overarching thought behind Hellenistic Western Greek thinking is man is at the center of the universe and everything else is like a little box he puts inside and that orbits him. It's like we are the sun and the planets orbit around us. That's our life, my job, my career, my friendships, my finances, my education, my this, my that, my... And even then, God gets one of those little boxes that orbits around us. Christianity is just something I do. It's my religion. Scratch that off the list. Put it in that box. Put it up on the shelf. And when I need it, it's there. And I use it. After. Otherwise, this is me. This is my life. That's how a Western secular person thinks. That is not how a child of God is supposed to think. Believe it or not, the Word of God is not written like that at all. If you're new to the Bible, if you're reading it or exploring it, you might not understand why it's written the way that it's written. Why isn't it structured more logically? Like if you read a Christian book from a pastor or a writer, it's structured either in a chronological order or in a very logical order based on points and ideas. 
And it's structured in a way that our Western minds can understand, but the Bible is structured differently, and the books of the Bible communicate very differently. It's because God does it for a reason. He doesn't want you to think like a secular Western person. He wants you to think like a child of God. And the people who wrote the Bible were Jews. They had what we call a Hebraic way of thinking. And the big difference is that instead of taking everything in life and putting them in little boxes to categorize and control and manipulate according to their own whims, a Hebraic biblical way of thinking is God is at the center of everything and we're just one of those little planets orbiting him. A Hebraic way of looking at your faith is very experiential, it's very real, it's here and now, it's your life, it's, it's what m- makes up the substance of your life. It's a relationship rather than a religion. The reason why we struggle with that difference is because Greek thinking turns God, turns faith, turns the Bible into a religion. Rules and regulations you follow. An authentically biblical Hebraic way of thinking about God is an experience, a relationship. Faith is living, it's alive, it's producing life. It's the way we live, the way we think, the way we act. It's the center, it's the core of who we are. In fact, a Hebraic way of looking at God is God is this great big circle and we're one little speck in that circle. The Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. He holds everything together by the word of his power. We're just one little piece dependent on him. Jesus himself said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. But Greek thinking is, we're the vine, we're the branches, we're the entire thing, and God's one little fruit that we pluck when we need it. And if we come to the Bible with that way of thinking, we will trip up all the time. In a previous podcast, I talked about some of the principles of studying the Bible, and it goes hand in hand with this view. If you look at any of my previous podcasts about studying the Bible and the different principles, they all come down to the same thing. We read the entire Bible in its context, studying one passage with another. If you read the old with the new, we compare similar passages with one another, we put it all in context. That is a holistic complete view of scripture. We don't pluck one book out or one verse out and spin it off to mean something we want. We don't restructure the Bible to fit the way we like it. We look at the Bible as its whole, as Paul called it, the whole counsel, the whole wisdom of God given to us, and we study it in light of every other book. And that is what we're, that's what I'm talking about when I say a Hebraic biblical view of God's word is that. So in order for us to get closer to that way of thinking, you might be wondering if this is new to you and you go, I want to think more like that so I could understand God's word and, and actually know him in a better way. Where do we start? Well, we start by putting aside our preconceived ideas about God and church and faith so that we may have been raised to believe from a church or a pastor or a person. And we say, look what the Bible teaches. And any time where we read the Bible, it says one thing and then uh, someone else says another, we, just, we believe what the Bible says. So there's a lot we could go into, but today I wanted to focus on two uh, common ideas from the Bible. Two terms you may have heard. You may have heard pastors mention it's from the Bible itself, and they're called types and shadows. You may have heard people throw those words around, and you're not sure where they come from, what they mean. But today I wanted to just briefly touch on it as a jumping off point, as a window into understanding the language of the Bible. One thing to keep in mind is that The Bible was written a very long time ago. I'm sure you know that. It was written by hand at various times. Different prophets and people, men of God, wrote it down either as letters or as uh, accounts of their their actions, historical, etc. They wrote down scrolls and and things like that, and then people carefully made copies and manuscripts of it. It was all written by hand in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. This is long before the printing press, long before modern printing mechanics and obviously computer technology. So there was no such thing as underlining. There's no such thing as bolding the words or italicizing or highlighting or circling or even quotation marks. All the things we use today to emphasize something, they didn't have. You know, if you're sending someone an email and you really want to emphasize a certain point, You could put it in bold or put it in all caps, which typically people think is kind of rude, so don't do that, or italicize it, or or if you're reading a book and you really want to remember this part, you'll highlight it. Even even on tablets, you could highlight uh, in the text. That didn't exist back then, so there had to be a way for God speaking through these people to emphasize something so that depending on, regardless of the translation or the method or whether it's in a book or on a scroll or on a screen, the emphasis will come through. 
And there's many ways the Bible actually does this. When there's something very important God wants to say in the Bible, he finds very creative, unique ways to emphasize it. So that as we're reading it, these things come through in a very strong way. And there's different ways God does that. And one of them is through types and shadows. I wanted to focus first on the concept of shadows. We get that term from Colossians chapter 2. Paul is explaining how they don't have to follow the Jewish customs anymore. It wasn't necessary for born-again believers to have to follow the law of Moses and all those customs. It was good to learn of them and to understand them, but it wasn't necessary for them to follow them. So Paul explained this a lot to the Gentile church. They're in union with Christ. They're right with God because of Jesus' perfect work on the cross, not by following certain rules or certain holidays or eating certain food. And he explains this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. He says, Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. When he says food or drink, festivals or new moons, he's talking about all the regulations in the law. If you're not familiar with the Old Testament law, they couldn't eat certain things and they had to eat certain certain things under certain times and they had to offer up sacrifices and there were all these festivals, the new moons and the new month of the of each month and the Sabbath day. There's a weekly Sabbath and different Sabbaths. There's Sabbaths that came every few years, every seven years, every 49 years, and there's Sabbaths before a major holidays. And the entire Jewish system was built upon all these regulations and observances. And all of them were for good. They're from God. But in Christ, it was no longer necessary to follow these things to be justified before God. That's why Paul says, they are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Well, he's saying the things taught in the Old Testament were shadows of the things to come. That seems like a weird concept. What does he mean, shadows? There, there's stories in the, in the Bible. There, there, there are law. There are prophecies. There's, there's songs. How are they shadows? Well, let's think about it. You know, God is really good at communicating to us where we're at, right at our level, so we can grasp his truth and then go deeper into it. Let's think about a literal shadow. If you're standing outside in this bright sunlight coming at you from the right, it's hitting you on your right side, and if you look to your left on the ground, there's a shadow of your body. Okay, now that shadow is more or less the shape of who you are. It could be a little longer or shorter depending on the angle the sun is hitting you. But it gives the impression that you're standing there. If someone was looking out their window and they couldn't see you because maybe a tree was blocking their view, but they looked on the ground and saw that shadow, they know someone is standing there. Now they won't know too many details about you. They might not even know, you know how tall you are. They won't know your age. They won't know what your face looks like. They might not even know if you're a man or a woman. But based on that shadow, they could get a kind of a, a, a glimpse of who you are. They might figure out the shape of your body, you know, two arms, two legs. They may even get an idea of what your hair looks like. If you're wearing a coat or, or shorts, they can get a lot of details about you, who you are, just from looking at your shadow. Not everything, but they get glimpses of what's standing there. And that's what the Bible means by a shadow of things to come. The Old Testament, for us and for those who lived through it, was a shadow of what we have now in Christ. This is, this is common throughout the entire Old Testament. It's why it's so important to study it to gain greater insight into what we have in Christ. So they didn't see Jesus or the New Covenant during that time because it didn't happen yet. Christ had yet, not yet come and not yet offered himself up and rose again. But the things like the law and the events that took place and the different people and the different circumstances, they all were orchestrated by God to point to the coming of Jesus. So when we look back and we see the stories in the Old Testament, we see, oh, this, is, this was speaking of Christ. This was pointing to Christ. This was, this was describing a certain aspect of Jesus or the new covenant or the relationship we have with him. And you might be asking yourself, well, that's fine. Paul even says here, we don't have to follow those rules anymore. We don't have to watch what we eat or follow certain Sabbaths or new moons. So why do we care at all? Well, it's very important because Paul knew the Old Testament very well. Okay, he studied it all his life. And that was the foundation of his teaching of the gospel. And if he says there are shadows of things to come, but the substance is Christ, that means while we are no longer necessary to observe these things to be right with God, there's still value in them because they teach us about God. And see, this is one of the what I feel is a, a common stumbling block for many Christians is that they're familiar with the New Testament or certain books of the New Testament, maybe the Gospels, maybe certain other of the, the letters, 
but they know very little about the Old Testament, and they don't think it's relevant. Oh, outside of maybe the Psalms or the Proverbs, they don't know much. They don't read Genesis or Exodus. They're not studying First and Second Kings or any of the prophetic books, and they think, who needs it? Who needs it? We're, we're born again. We're Christians. We don't need that anymore. And throughout church history, there have been some people who said we don't even read, need the whole Old Testament at all. We just read the New. And those people were considered heretics and kicked out of the church because of how seriously wrong they were. The reason why we need to study the Old Testament, one of the reasons, is because of the shadows of Christ. The more acquainted we are with these shadows, the more richer our faith in Jesus is. Because if you think about it, the New Testament's pretty short. And the Old Testament is significantly longer. What is God telling us? That we need to know the Old Testament quite a bit in our understanding of the New. It's, it's The more you study it, the more you see how interconnected both Testaments are. And how we, there's no way to truly understand the books of the New Testament and the faith and the covenant of Jesus without having a thorough foundation of the Old Testament. Now, when you first came to faith, you may not know much of anything except about Jesus. And that was fine. Salvation is not based on your knowledge of the Bible. But if you want to grow deeper in your faith. God has entrusted to you this wonderful faith in Jesus, and it's founded upon the Word of God. The Bible says the Word of God is a seed that's been sown into our hearts that can grow into this great big tree bearing much fruit. But if we don't water the seed and let it grow in us, we're missing out. And that process begins when we study and meditate on the Word of God, both the old and the new. But you might get tripped up because you're like, what, is, what do I care about Abraham offering up his son Isaac? What do I care about Joseph being betrayed by his brothers? Well, when we recognize these are all shadows of the things to come, then we realize, wow, I could learn a great deal about God, about my faith, about Jesus, about the church, about the kingdom from these passages. perfect example is the story of Abraham and Isaac. In the book of Genesis, God promised Abraham a son. Even though he was old and his wife couldn't have children, God said, you will have a son from your wife, and from him will become a great nation. He said, there be as many as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. That's how great his nation will be. From a man who couldn't have kids. That was a huge promise that required faith in God and an ignoring of your earthly circumstances. And in time, God gave him that son. But guess what happened? By the time Isaac was roughly in his teenage years, God told Abraham, okay, go up to this mountain and sacrifice your son to me. Now, we know biblically, never in Scripture, not even the Old Testament, did God require human beings to sacrifice humans. In fact, in Jeremiah, he said, it never even entered my mind. That something is so horrible, he never even asked. Whenever the Jews and offered up sacrifices to God under the covenant, it was always lambs, goats, bulls, other animals. No, never any human beings. But here, God is telling him, sacrifice your son. And Abraham obeys, and he brings his son. And if you study this passage, we see that the son was forced to carry the wood on his back. He brought him up to the mountaintop. The son asked Abraham, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself the sacrifice. And right at the end, before he sacrifices him, the angel of the Lord appears in heaven and says, Don't. Instead, sacrifice this ram who was caught in the thorns. And we see all throughout this story is a picture, shadows of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. Because God told Abraham at the very beginning, it's so amazing. He says, Take your son, your one and only son whom you love. And it's the same phrase that Jesus himself uses in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only Son. So you see right there, this amazing picture, even back in Genesis, of God planning to send Jesus. And God was teaching Abraham how important this is. Because the promised Son, his only Son, the Son he loves, he's offering up as a sacrifice. Imagine just how great a cost it was for the Father to offer up his Son for us. And Abraham, he didn't sacrifice Isaac and received him, as it says in Hebrews, back from the dead, in a sense. So Jesus came back from the dead, literally, to give us life. And the picture of Isaac carrying the wood was like Christ carrying the cross. The picture of the actual sacrifice caught in the thorns, pictured Christ in the thorns on his head. You see, the, the, the Old Testament is rich in these pictures of Jesus. And the more we study them, the more we recognize how embedded God's plan was to send Jesus to save us. And if that's how far back in advance God planned it, that he has the story, 
rippling through the Old Testament, how much more is your life already in the Father's hands? That if your salvation was prepared long before, carefully planned out, with these shadows put in Scripture to teach us, to lead us to Christ, how much more every error of your life is in God's hands? He could foresee Christ's coming. He could foresee your life. Your coming to faith in Jesus and every step of the way after that all the way till eternity. You're no, nothing's been left to chance. Nothing's been neglected. Nothing's been forgotten. It's all been a part of God's plan. So when we study scripture, if you're re reading through the Old Testament and you're not sure how it's relevant to you, ask yourself, where in this passage are there shadows or could there be shadows pointing to Jesus, pointing to the new covenant, pointing to our relationship with him? It's mostly, the shadows are mostly Jesus. So if you look at that shadow on the ground, it's Jesus. But it also speaks of everything connected to Christ, our life in Christ, the church, the new covenant, salvation. They're all hinted at through the Old Testament in shadows. Again, not the full picture because Christ had not yet come, but shadows to build the foundation and build our faith. Because you might doubt, is this all true? But you look at Genesis and say, wow, all the way back then, God was preparing the coming of Jesus. And that strengthens our faith. So if you have someone, an unbeliever, who says, all this New Testament stuff, all those books were written years later, it's all unreliable, you go, oh, really? Look at the story of Abraham. Same phrase, one and only son. Look at this story. Look at this passage. God had this planned all along. And they may reject that, or they may say, wow, I'd never thought about it before. I had no idea that even the Old Testament speaks of Jesus. That's a big problem that unbelievers have. People un unacquainted with the Bible, they say, the Old Testament was nothing but pain and punishment and wrath and judgment from God. In the New Testament, suddenly God's so nice and he's so loving. And they don't understand it's the same God, the same Jesus, the same Lord. And in the Old Testament, God was just as compassionate and loving as he is in the New. And in the New, he's just as righteous and wrathful against sin as he was in the Old. Check out Revelation and you'll know exactly what I'm saying. So this is so valuable as we study scripture to look for those shadows. You know, you read through the Old Testament, go, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in this? Where's Jesus in this? And the Holy Spirit will show you. The other term that is common is the type. The type. Again, it comes from the Bible. In Romans 5, Paul uses this phrase. He's talk, talking about one particular type. Starting at verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So there's a lot going on in that passage. And Paul talks about it here and in other places that Adam, the first man, was a type of Christ. And you hear that phrase a lot in Bible teachings and sermons and in different study books, you hear a type of Christ. That was a type of Christ, a type of Christ, a type of Christ. And you go, what the heck does that mean? And it doesn't seem right if we use that phrase in other contexts. Like, that is a type of kangaroo. Well, that makes sense because it's a kangaroo and it's a species of animals and they're all like each other. But it's actually very much in a similar way. When we say something is a type of Christ, we're not saying they are Christ or that there's more than one Christ, or that they are Jesus in a different form. We're saying the role this person played in the Bible pointed to what Jesus would do when he came. It's very similar to shadows, it's, 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 it, but instead of speaking of maybe general principles of Christ's coming or salvation, it speaks specifically of the role that Christ played. And these earlier people, in, in either foreshadowing, again shadowing, pointing to Jesus, or the opposite, they're fulfilling a role that points to Jesus. We use the term in literature, archetypes. That's a type of character that certain people in your story will fill. There are archetypes that are heroic and villainous and the damsel in distress. You've heard of those things. Those are archetypes that when someone sits down and writes a story, they fit those characters in as needed. But they fill a role and point to a universal concept that the reader can understand. And in the Bible, Christ is our Redeemer. There's one Christ, one Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Savior. Long before he came, though, there were people in the Bible who served roles that were pointing to him or would educate us on him, either in the positive or the negative. In this case, Adam was in the negative. 
He was the first man. All human beings descended from him, but because he sinned, all human beings inherited that fallen nature. Which is why the Bible said all men sin because of him. Because if you're, you reproduce after your own kind, so if Adam, the first man, was sinful, all his children would be sinful. And so that became a type of Christ. Why? Because through one man, many died. But through the next man, the Bible says, in verse 15, But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. It says in 19, For as many, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, also by one man's obedience many would be made righteous. So, Paul talks about it very detailed here and in other places he touches upon it. Adam became a type of Christ because through him all people became sinners, but through Christ all who believe become saints. And it's a very similar dynamic. We descended naturally by Adam, but when we put our faith in Jesus, our new spiritual inheritance or descendant, so to speak, comes from Jesus. We are no longer sons of Adam, sons of the earth, earthly people destined to die in our sins. We are now sons of God, children of God, whose lineage comes from Jesus, spiritually speaking. And while our spirits are now in Christ, in that lineage, our physical bodies will also one day become a part of that lineage at the rapture. So Adam becomes a type of Christ, but in the negative, but it still serves that purpose. Types are very detailed. They almost become a theological study of the role Christ would play. So by studying Adam and his sin, we learn about Jesus, a very specific purpose that Jesus served. And we see that all throughout the Bible. So shadows are either people or stories or moments that illustrate certain elements of Jesus, like we talked about um, with Abraham and Isaac, it talks about Jesus and the cross. Types are specifically talking about individuals who served a role that educates us about Jesus. And actually, can go very deep in our understanding of who Christ is, as we see here in Romans 5. Another good type of Christ, I mean, Honestly, most of the central figures in the Old Testament, in one way or another, you could say was a type of Christ, meaning what they did for God or their disobedience to God illustrates something about Jesus. There are people in the Old Testament who are types of the Antichrist, like Nebuchadnezzar earlier in his uh, life, in his disobedience to idolatry. He, He erected a huge statue and forced the world to worship it. Much like in the end times, the Antichrist and the false prophet will erect their own image and demand the world to worship it. So we see that a lot in the Bible. So in the Old Testament, most of this godly people, in some role, did something that educates us about Christ. Another good example would be Joseph. Now, how was he a type of Christ? Well, Joseph was betrayed and rejected by his brothers, the sons of Israel. He was made a slave and a prisoner, but was glorified amongst the Gentiles ruled over them secondhand to the high king. And at the end of the story, his son, his brothers come, don't recognize him, but at the very end, he reveals himself to them. Their eyes are opened, and now they're reconciled, and they're u- united. Israel, the Bible says, comes back to life when he realizes his son's alive, and they're reunited. So you see, once again, a very clear type of Christ in the story of Israel's relationship with the Christ. Jesus came to his own, it says in John 1. They did not receive him outside of a remnant. They rejected him. The the Jewish rulers rejected him. He was betrayed by one he trusted. Even his own followers, when he was arrested, fled. He was made a slave, a servant, the Bible says. The Bible says in Philippians, when he became a human, that was like becoming a slave. And then he submitted himself even further to the death on the cross like a criminal. But he rose again, and he was glorified by the Gentiles. He's at the right hand of the Father, like Joseph's at the right hand of the Pharaoh. And the Gentiles are benefited by Christ, just like the Egyptians are benefited by Joseph. And at the end, at Christ's second coming, although now the Jews, most of the Jews don't recognize Jesus as their Messiah, when he returns and reveals himself to them, they will all be, once and for all, reconciled to him. And Israel, just like Jacob, will be revived and come back to life. That is what we call a type of Christ. The person's life served as educating us about something of Jesus' nature. And there's many more. David is a huge type. Moses is. Many of the prophets were. There's elements of their life, of their service to God, of their story in Scripture that educates us on who Jesus is. That's a type. Types and shadows, you see how they go hand in hand. And often they'll 
We'll use the terms interchangeably, but the principle is the same. And you might ask yourself, why did God do this? Why can't he say it plainly? In my next podcast, I'm going to talk a little more about parables and the significance of those and why God chooses to do it this way. Why does he hide it like this? Why doesn't he just come out and tell us? Well, we have prophecies where God lays out very clearly uh, the role of Christ throughout Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, but they're all kind of inter spliced with other prophecies. Sometimes they're hidden, sometimes they're sometimes they're overlaid with other teachings and other stories, and they almost seem like they're hidden or masked, and we don't know why. Why did God do it that way? Why did Jesus teach in parables? Why is there so much of that in the Bible? We will get to that, hopefully, in the next episode, where we learn the purpose of parables and the purpose of God, in a sense, hiding his truth in order for us not only to find it, but to better understand it and learn it in a deeper way. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. Every episode and other content is available at lightningpodcast.org. Thank you.